It seemed like uh, a year ago since we played Air Force at Air Force. A lot's happened since then, but uh, we took advantage of the loss and competed at a higher level since then. And so no loss is good, but I think we've gotten better since then. Uh, Air Force is playing at a really high level. When they beat us, I think everyone thought, what a monumental upset. And they've gone on to win four of the last five games, uh, scored 106 on Vegas, beat Boise by 13 at home, uh, led uh, Nevada for 30 minutes at Nevada, and then just won a really big double overtime game at San Jose in which they attempted 47 three-point shots. So they're going to be a real challenge. We've been working hard. Our kids are excited to get another opportunity to play them. And uh, we will put it all out on the floor tomorrow night. What was it about that? You were just talking to the players about that. It seemed to be that there was a little bit of a turning point uh, for them in terms of effort. What was it about that loss that kind of resonated with them? Yeah, I just told them at the end of the game that we have to compete at a higher level. And I've said it in the press conferences since then that uh, X's and O's, none of that matter unless we compete at a higher level. And I didn't think we competed uh, at a high enough level to win on the road. Now, we played hard at times, but there was a play or two. It's, it's, competing usually is just one or two plays a half that can make a difference in a game. It's fronting the post instead of settling in behind. It, it, it's it's uh, diving on the floor uh, uh, earlier than the opponent. And so it's not like a whole play hard issue. It's just you have to compete every play if you want to win in this league. And so I think we've tried to compete harder, longer uh, since that Air Force loss. What's different about this Air Force team than, than maybe the past few years? Why are they having more success? Other, other than obviously the league isn't as good as it has been, but, but what, what are they doing tactically that's making them more effective? They're playing what, they're playing like teams that are successful do. They're, they're, they're playing with a swagger. Mm -hmm. They think they're good. And they play hard like that and they play with great confidence. And so they're a, a confident group of guys right now. They think they're going to win every time they take the floor. And you watch the Nevada game, it was a hard-fought, tough game, and they competed like crazy at Nevada, who's the best team in the conference right now. And so they'll come out here and compete tomorrow, but so will we. So it's going to be a, it's going to be a, a very, very good college basketball game tomorrow night. Brian, when you say the guys, they're competing better. Do you think to get them to that level, is it something you show them on film? Is it verbally talking to them, or is it something that they have to take on themselves or a combination of everything? It's everything. Uh, we showed the film when they, we felt like they didn't you know, finish a play. Yeah. They took just a half step backwards. Uh, we talked to them on it, and then we have to practice like we're going to play. So we told them they have to compete in practice before they're able to compete in a game. And so I think they're competing at a higher level in practice. They're going at each other. They're concentrating longer. And uh, it's not atypical for a young team with eight sophomores and freshmen in the top 11. You know, they're growing still and they're learning. And uh, no better example than Jalen, you know, who struggled for a while trying to find his rhythm. And now he's found his rhythm. And so every player finds his rhythm at a different time, whether it's defensively, offensively. And they're all starting to find a little bit better rhythm as we move forward with the season. Uh, he's still in the boot, you know, more to protect it. He's uh, getting better. The swelling's going down. He's rehabbing two or three times a day in the pool. And so uh, I would still say he's probably a game-time decision, but uh, hopefully we'll have him back for sure by San Jose this weekend. Brian, I know you can't talk specifically on specific recruits and not, but there's a local player, an eighth grader in San Diego, that's generating a lot of national buzz. Generally speaking, when recruiting young players before they get to high school, is that the same process as a junior or senior in high school, or is it different because they're a phenom? How, how do you go about that? You know, you try to identify players at, at the earliest age you can, and obviously it's easier to do in your own town. You know, the buzz of a player will get started early, and we'll try to get out and see them, or they'll come to, the, to our team camp and play in front of us. And, you know, so we'll just start building relationships like we do with any recruit. But obviously when they're – Hometown talents, they get more attention from us earlier, obviously. Do you think there should be an age limit on when you can offer a scholarship for all college sports? 
Uh, or, or a grade, grade level or anything? Yeah, we, we tend not to offer scholarships real early. You know, uh, when they ask, are you going to offer, I said, are you willing to take it right now? Well, no. I said, well, then there's no sense that we have to offer right now. If you're not going to take it, we can wait till you're ready. So, you know, we, we're not big into offering uh, really young player scholarships. You know, I think a lot of that uh, offering, uh, it, it helps boost certain AAU programs. You know, they get a young kid or they get kids in their program and they'll say, well, this kid's been offered by 14 schools. And that kind of helps them say, I'm going to get the next one. You know, you play in that other program, their, their kids aren't being offered. And I, I got ninth graders, 10th graders are being offered by 22 schools. You know, so sometimes it's, it's, it, it's part of the, the game, the self-promotion game, you know, for the individual player and for uh, the program they might be playing for. Fish is going to be inducted into the Breitbart Hall of Fame on Thursday. Um, I just wonder what your thoughts are on, on how retirement has suited him. Uh, do you think he misses it? Um, do you think he doesn't miss it? You know, what, what are your thoughts on how uh, uh, Coach Fisher as a retired coach? He would never say he misses it, but obviously when you do something your entire life, you're going to miss it. So, yeah, he misses it. I'm sure he doesn't miss some parts of it. You know, I'm sure he misses being uh, – with the kids and, and coaching, but I'm sure the recruiting and some of the other stuff he had to do as a head coach, he probably doesn't miss that much. But the camaraderie, the being part of a team, I'm sure he misses that to a degree. Who wouldn't? Some people, you know, do very well with retirement. Some people really struggle with it. Where do you think he fits in there? I think he's enjoying his retirement, yeah. you know. And some guys can't wait to retire to play golf. You know, coach isn't a golfer, you know. He's uh, – the consummate family man. So uh, he spends time with family, and part of his family is still here. I see him every day, you know, when he drops Mark off at practice, and, and I see him every day. And what better mentor to have than Steve Fisher on a daily basis? Brian, what, what do you miss about uh, Coach Fisher being retired? Well, you miss – you're still friends, but you miss the daily, all-day interaction. I mean, when you spend 30 years with somebody – you know, they become a big part of your life. So it's like a family member. So, you know, I, I enjoy seeing him every day still, and he always offers to help in any way he can. And sometimes I take him up on that offer. But, uh, you know, to see him every day is not like he uh, retired and ran off to Naples, you know. I get to see him every day, and instead of, you know, once or twice a year, I see him daily. So it, it still feels good to have him around. Is there any piece of advice he's given you this year that, Uh, I'm trying to think if there's one nugget. It's just the daily interactions, you know. It's just we talk, and we talk a little bit about everything, you know, from the team. And, you know, he's our biggest supporter, and he's my biggest supporter. So, you know, I'm blessed to have him there. And, and if I have an idea to bounce off, you know, it's like any head coach who retires. He doesn't want to feel like he's just running in and offering advice unless I'm seeking it, you know. So... You know, we have conversation. I might ask him something, but he's not one to run in and say, you need to do this, you need to do that. That's not in his nature, and that's not in our relationship. So uh, he always has good advice if I ask, and, and we do that dance and, and enjoy each other's company. And, and uh, he's an Aztec through and through, and he wants this program to continue to succeed at a high level.